You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Stack Waddy game. Who's going first? Well, shall I go first? I could do. Go on. It, okay, this is from an idea that was sent in by one of our listeners, uh, Mark Smith, which I have I've uh, elaborated upon and adapted. Um, English villages All right. with double two-syllable names, like, for example, Ashton Gifford, Sutton Montes, oh, Colton okay. Denham, the kind Dunton of places, Bassett. The kind of places <laughs> where, uh, well, P.G. Woodhouse goes for the weekend, doesn't it, really? Precisely or, I, I, that. Jeeves goes for, uh, sorry, Jeeves. Uh, Bertie, Bertie Wooster goes for the weekend. Or it's the kind of place where uh, murders take place in Agatha Christie. Absolutely it? right. Okay, but they all good. sound like they all sound like amusing characters from various colourful professions. So, right. are you prepared to risk your reputation and play Leafy Hamlet or real life minor celebrity? Okay, <laughs> okay. So, number one, Wilton St Hill. Is that a boundary bashing Trinidad cricketer from the nineteen thirties or a <laughs> postcard village near Ashby de la Zouche? <laughs> Wilton St Hill. Oh dear! It's it, it's a cricketer. It's a cricketer. <laughs> it is indeed. No, it's a cricketer. Very good. Okay, number two, Carlton Curlew. Oh, I was that a mustachioed crumpeteer in twenties racetrack poster boy jailed for importing absinthe, <laughs> or is it a modest burg eleven miles southeast of Leicester with a church from the eleventh century? <laughs> Carlton Curl, you go on. It's, it's just south of Leicester. It is. It's a <laughs> these are, I'm afraid so these are going to be terribly obvious. OK, Barclay Gaskin. Barclay Gaskin, <laughs> a work-shy but notoriously devious post-war spinner from the British Guiana, <laughs> or some thatched cottages ten miles from Ipswich. Barclay Gaskin. And they're they're plausible, pretty- aren't they? Uh, I, I think it must be time to give Barclay Gaskin a couple of overs before lunch. You're absolutely uh, right. He is, of course, a cricketer. <laughs> OK, OK, number four, number four, OK. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> Croxton Kerriel. Oh, this is... That's great. Really... Croxton Kerriel, is that a tenor sax player from the Victor Sylvester dance band who died of syphilis <laughs> at the age of 21? Or a civil parish in the Melton Borough of Leicester <laughs> oh, just outside of Grantham? It's got to be the first one. Oh, that's lovely. That's very sweet of you. It's no, it's, to a be... no, it's a village. It's oh, really? A village. But, oh, that but actually, there are so... lots. There are lots of names. So of villages that sound like, like uh, jazz players, you know. Okay, number six. Everton Sorry. Mattis. Dependable walloper of the leather on Willow from the Leeward Islands. All Everton. Winner of, winner of the Cotswolds Best Kept Village Award 2019. Oh. <laughs> All Everton's are West Indian fast bowlers. Surely for good. You're absolutely fight. right. It's a fast <laughs> bowler. He is a fast bowler. All right. Chil- Chilthorn Doma. Now, is that the late 30s songwriter who gave us Kiss Me Goodnight, Sergeant Major, and Hang Out Your Washing on the Siegfried line? Oh, <laughs> am I making this too easy? Or is it a small parish in Somerset mentioned in the Doomsday Book? Oh, I'm going to go for the small parish in Somerset. Uh, you're absolutely right. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, Stratton Audley. Stratton Audley. Is he the man who invented binoculars, or is that a quaint settlement near Bicester, once famed for its moated castle? <laughs> I am enjoying these, I have to say. <sighs> Stratton Audley. The man who invented binoculars. I can't believe I... W- First thing I do on Sunday morning is this. Um, so it's the man who invented binoculars. No, <laughs> no it's not. No, it's a, it's a quaint settlement near Bicester. Oh, my God, I've got, I've had one, one back. Okay, uh, ben, okay, two to go. Brenton Parchment, <laughs> right arm off break supremo from St Elizabeth, Jamaica, or a Kentish retreat blighted by the arrival of the M20. Kentish retreat. No, no, Brenton Parchment is a is a is a, is a, a Jamaican cricketer. <laughs> and lastly, Nelson Betancourt. A dependent, dependable rifler of shots over the pavilion roof from Trinidad and Tobago, or the Devonshire home of the National Trust Betancourt Priory. He's from Trinidad. Yes, he is. <laughs> You'll notice the theme though, all the all the real ones, are actually, right. which, is, which is from the the original concept from Mark Smith. Oh God, that's good. But it's, I yeah. love that. I love the idea. I I often go at it the other way around. I love the idea of. Um, a, a, 
play li- odd little British play- English place names of that kind. Yeah, um, that you that become names because I used to fantasize. I'm never going to write a detective novel, but if I did write a detective novel, my detective would be called Farnley Tyus. Oh, brilliant. Farnley Tyus is a small place near Huddersfield. Yeah, yeah, and it's always struck me ever since I was a small boy. That's like the name of somebody. It is. Barnley Tyus. I know. And it's There's another of, fantastic it one. Up. There's a Go lovely on. one in Wiltshire, uh, famous for its uh, grottos of scientific interest called Font Hill Bishop. Oh. And I always thought that sounded like a kind of tweedy, port-chugging thespian, <laughs> famed for a decade of playing major Metcalf in the mousetrap. You know, <laughs> Font Hill Bishop, you know, you can't believe that's a place, can you? It's good, isn't it? So Font- come on, what do you got? What do you got? What, Font Hill get- Bishop will give us this Macbeth. That's right. Uh, OK. Uh, well, I, I, I'm very much in the shade this week. Uh, you may remember when, um, when Tom Waits first appeared. There's Tom Waits. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and in the in the mid seventies, he was writing about a, a milieu that people had never really written about in pop song before, and so critics seeking to, to describe him would often grasp for the adjective Runyon-esque oh, in yeah, tribute yeah, yeah, yeah. to the great the great Damon Runyon, there, yeah, yeah, the yeah. great Damon Runyon, the the uh, Broadway short story writer of the thirties and forties. Uh, from whom we get guys and dolls and loads of our cliched views about Broadway come from Damon Runyon. Damon Runyon, very similar to P.G. Woodhouse in the sense that because he made up his world, his world can never date. You know, it's a completely invented idea. So I'm asking you to play. Okay. Story by Damon Runyon. Or lesser known song by Tom Waits. Okay, that's, good. that's hey. very good. I'm, I'm, I know a bit of Tom Waits, but not the outer reaches. So you've pretty much got me here. Go on. How, much, is... how much do you know about Damon Runyon? You know that may be that may again be not a vast amount. So okay. we, that, that's, I'm, yeah, okay, that's that's super. so. Here we go. Cemetery bait. Cemetery bait. Is that a story by Damon Runyon, or is that? A lesser known song by Tom Waits. Cemetery Bait. Is that a good name? It's Cemetery really good. Bait. I'm just thinking of the song Cemetery Gate, actually. But, uh, no, so the, which was, was that a Smith song? I'm trying to remember now. So oh, yeah. I'm saying, I'm saying, um, I'm saying it's Damon Runyon. It is. It's a story oh. written in 1932. Yeah. Um, it begins one pleasant morning in early April, a character by the name of Gentleman George wakes up to find himself in a most embarrassing predicament. He wakes up to find himself in a cell in the state penitentiary at Trenton, New Jersey. And while a cell in a state penitentiary is by no means a novelty to George, and ordinarily will cause him no confusion whatever, the trouble is this particular cell is what is known as the death house. Brilliant. How could you not carry on reading? (laughs) It's absolutely brilliant. The greatest advice I was ever given about any kind of writing was the purpose of the first sentence is to make you read the second sentence. The purpose of the second <laughs> sentence is to make you read the third sentence, <laughs> etc. That really, cracks it, doesn't it? My that's God. really true. Yeah. Okay, uh, here we go. Baseball Hattie. Is that a Damon Runyon? Tom Waits. <laughs> it's Tom Waits. Am I right? No, you're wrong. Uh, no! Oh, God! 1936, it comes on springtime and the little birdies are singing in the trees in Central Park and the grass is green all around and I'm at the polo grounds of the opening day of the baseball season when who do I behold but baseball Hattie? So, not a time way it's sign. Okay, moving on. Spidey's Wild Ride. Spidey's Wild Ride, story by Damon Runyon or song by Tom Waits. Well, well, there was a voice. I'm thinking along the lines of Frank's Wild Years. So I, that surely must be Tom Waits. It is. The smoke from the battlefish and the rain soaked through, and the wheelmen left the shore, and barns tumbled and silos flew across 15 miles of bad road tar. A big boltrometer hung on to the side, and the pig dogs trembled on Spidey's Wild Ride. 
That's brilliant. <laughs> Couldn't be anybody else, really, I suppose. Okay. Do you remember that television program we invented when we were, were called called uh, it's called uh, it's just called Tom Waits, wasn't it? And it was about <laughs> <laughs> about a sort of some kind of rap scallion in a basement somewhere, chained to a radiator, bashing bashing the central heating system with a jawbone of an a, of an ass. It just, <laughs> it was kind of, just just waits. Just wait, just waiting for something to happen. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. The whole series of them. Okay, tabletop Joe. Is that a Tom Waits song, or is it a Damon Runyon I'm story? Going for, I'm going for Waits. It is. I've got the feeling. Yeah. I had trouble with the pedals, but I had a strong left hand, and I could play Stravinsky on the baby grand. Okay. Uh, tight shoes. Tight shoes. Tom Waits song, God, Damon Runyon. Mighty. Damon yeah, Runyon I'm, story. I'm absolutely just having a wild stab in the dark with saying Runyon. It is. Uh, 1936. All this begins the day a young character by the name of Rupert Salsinger sells Jaime Minsk, the horse player, a pair of shoes that are too tight. Brilliant. <laughs> I must, I must read With hilarious that. consequences. <laughs> <It's Yeah. hilarious. laughs> All right. Buzz Flederjohn. Buzz Flederjohn. I'm saying Damon Runyon too. No, Tom Waits. I I've still got a I've very difficult, <laughs> difficult name to, to, to intone in song, but there we are. I stood on the roof, stood toward dark to get a better look at the Vleda John's lawn. Big sharp pistols, ammo too, nothing but books about World War II. Rottweiler, Doberman, a Pinkerton guard. I ain't allowed in Buzz Vleda John's yard. Uh, fantastic. Okay. And, That's okay. fantastic. All right, I'll give Your you voice one, getting all the more gravelly. Yes, it, it <laughs> does. I'll give you one more. Go on. This, I, this is beautiful. It's a beautiful title. All horse players die broke. All horse players die broke. Is that a Damon Runyon story? Or is that a Tom White song? I'm thinking it's Runyon. I don't know why. It uh, is. It is. It, but that's what a rich seam that is. <laughs> <laughs> My brother-in-law is a major uh, better on the horses. You only ever hear about the wins. Absolutely. Oh, my Lord. He once put uh, a, a, a large amount of money. He, he tends to bet uh, large amounts of money on small odds, you know, and he did it on a, on a race that was happening in a year's time, and he told the people he was in the room with, if that horse won, he'd take them all to uh, Sicily for, for a week's holiday, all paid for by him. And uh, just under a year later, he rang, said, keep an eye out for Saturday. And that evening, he rang and said, start packing. Can really? you imagine how rarely that must happen? <laughs> you know, we never hear about the other stuff, but oh, that's no. pretty amazing, isn't it? To be able to take yeah. six people on all in Sicily for a week. You know, I was, I, was, I, was, I was catching up with, there's a very fine American actor who's very well known for, he pops up in loads of things. Yeah. Um, but he's well known for doing impressions called Kevin Pollock, I think. Yeah, and uh, he's one of those guys that once you've seen one clip of him on YouTube, on a on a chat show, it, it moves you on to another one. You can see another one. Yeah, yeah. And he was he was telling a story about he got cast with his young actor to make he was in a minor part. He had a scene with Walter Matthau, and Walter Matthau was well known for being a major major horse player right throughout his life. Yeah, I'm going to tell you two things about Walter Matthau. So <laughs> Kevin Follett, Pollock's hanging around with Walter Matthau, um just prior to shooting. And he's trying to ingratiate himself with the elder, the venerable comic actor. It says, so, so, uh, Mr. Matto, you know, it's quite a good script, isn't it? <laughs> and Matto goes, it's a piece of, shit, piece of shit, kid, but I owe my bookie two million. Get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> and when Matto died, this is not apocryphal, on the order of service at the funeral, on the back, were his tips for the weekend's race. That's fantastic. <laughs> that's lovely. Oh, my <laughs> Lord, that's brilliant. <laughs> Mel so, Smith was a major betting fiend, wasn't he? They always talked about Mel, oh, Smith, Mel God, Smith. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, every time that, you know, if you talk about productions, when you go into a room and he'd be stuck in a porter cabin somewhere, just like with a credit card <laughs> and a telephone gibbering. You know? <laughs> it just completely takes over your life, you know. Steve Harley, Steve Harley, a big racing man. Is he? 
I think so. Yeah, he used to be a kind of racing journalist or something like that. I think he knows. I think he genuinely knows a lot. Mind you, in my experience, knowing a lot doesn't get you anywhere at all. No, yeah, absolutely. Because the pesky beasts may still lose. It can can perfectly easily yeah. happen. So that's um, that's the stack he game for this week, which you clearly win with the aid <laughs> of the of the. Sure. Yeah. Of your listener, who, who, whose original idea it was, um, we've been keeping tabs on the on the misadventures of Bruce Springsteen and uh, and his motorbike and some alcohol. What's the story, Mark? Well, exactly a week ago, we were we were we were doing a podcast, and we we mentioned that that night, i.e., last Sunday, his ad for Jeep was going to be shown in the intermission at the Super Bowl, wasn't it? Oh, of course. And so there's various issues. One is there's the ad itself. He decided, after all these years of saying he'd never do advertising and, and making make public statements about it, decided to do an ad, which was which you will have seen it, and it was a kind of national call for unity, paid for by Jeep, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it was all about, you know, re the reunited states, bringing the red and blue, the divided country back together again. And he went in the Jeep and he is a Jeep driver, to be fair. So it's not like he's taking a big leap with that. He went to the church in Lebanon, Kansas, the tiny U.S. Which is the center of the United yeah, it's States. The actual geographical heart. If you look it up in Google, Google Maps, there's something rather satisfying about seeing it. It's absolutely smack in the middle of America. So that was his symbol of a reunited America. So he did the ad. So I mean, there's an issue about whether or not he should have done the ad. He got his five million for it. He doesn't appear to have given it to, ch to charity. And to part of me thinks, well, fair enough. Good Lord. Bob Dylan did uh, Victoria's Secret. The, you know, I saw a band last night using the Beatles all together. Now everybody started doing it. And also musicians during the during the, these troubled times are, 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 are taking a different approach to earning money, aren't they? And Springsteen must have a huge staff to, to, to keep on board, you know, in preparation for tours, etc. So I kind of have some sympathy for that. But the issue was, wasn't it, about a few days ago, that it transpired that he'd been convicted or char charged back in November, where he was driving his motorcycle through the Gateway National Recreation Area in Sandy Hook Park, nearby where he lives, and apparently was stopped by or some fans, or they came up and talked to him. One of them had a bottle of tequila. This is the bit I really find out. One of them had a bottle of tequila. I think you're not, there is actually a, pro a prohibition rule uh, in this park. You're not allowed uh, Public to drink. drinking, yeah, you're probably drinking. Yeah. So yeah. maybe it was in a brown paper bag. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, they apparently offered, there he is on his mobile, they offered him a slug of tequila. And astonishingly, he took it. I mean, I, if a total stranger came up to you, Dave, you know, let's say nine in the morning with a bottle of tequila in a park and said, yeah, have some of this. I don't know. I literally would never do it. It never crossed my mind. But anyway, after that, he was then stopped by a policeman, wasn't he? And breathalyzed. And actually, he was he, under the limit. Well he? under the limit. Well under the limit. 0.2 and yeah, it's 0.8 whatever. to the limit. Yeah. I think. But anyway, they have this rule in uh, in this part of the around New Jersey where, where it, it, there are other there are other elements uh, towards a, 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 a DWI charge. If you can smell alcohol or people slur their words or their eyes are droopy or they look unsafe in charge of a vehicle, you can then you know, submit them to various um, sobriety tests, all that, you know, that nonsense of standing on one leg for 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah. And apparently didn't do very well in these tests. <laughs> so on. he was cooperative after a while, but he didn't oh. do very well in tests. So, you know, you've got this weird situation where he was arrested this was back in November. So when he recorded the ad for Jeep, which was uh, about six weeks ago, Jeep obviously would have known all about this. Sure. They would have known this story would have come out. Of course they would have done it. They must have done it. You couldn't possibly go into a thing like that without telling them. Well, you'd have and to sign have... You'd have to sign your contract. would have a clause say you didn't do anything to... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I see. So they went the into this to thinking... Distribute or whatever. Yeah, and they must have known that this news story would break. And they must have just assumed they will sell more Jeeps as a consequence. And I think they're right, actually. Don't you? Because the publicity has got... There's, there's two, two ways you look at it. One is, if you disapprove of what Bruce Springsteen did, then you'll think, OK, well, that's his fault, and he left Jeep looking exposed, and it's not their fault. And if you don't mind what he did, then you, 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 know, you feel warmly towards his maverick choice of wheels. That's the kind of guy he is, you know. So I think it's win-win. It's pretty odd, isn't it? Is it? The whole thing, really, because it's obviously a very long-range kind of branding exercise by Jeep, you know, to want to associate themselves with certain values and things. It's not like it's not like you run out and buy a Jeep after seeing 
God, no, and, and, and jeeps barely barely appear in the in the yes. ad. I mean, at one point you see a, a tiny little logo, and he's in he's driving one, but that's not the point of it. The point. No, is the, I tell about... you, the, the weird the thing that's really struck me as odd about the whole thing was, um, and I, I saw the ad before the before the all this came out about the drinking. Um, I thought, can anybody believe in two thousand and twenty one that the opinions of a musical star about the drawing together of the United States can make any difference whatsoever. Because if there's one thing we've learned for the last four or five years, it, it really doesn't. It doesn't move the dial one little bit at all. People make their decisions on the basis of loads and loads of things, on the basis of what they watch on TV or how they feel their life is going or whatever. The pronouncements of popular music performers, no matter who they are, just don't make any difference at all, do they? Do you remember David Bowie weighing in on the subject of the of the Scottish independence debate? You know, you think, <laughs> oh, no. Oh, that'll really help. Give Ireland back to the Irish and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I, I didn't did ever make any difference. The only difference, uh, the GQ piece that I read about this made a really good point about Springsteen. Said he's both America's boyfriend and its dad. No, I see. Which I thought was really good. So he is a very, very. He occupies a very a unique <laughs> position. But I, I agree with you. If Bruce Springsteen weighs in and says something, is, uh, are you uh, something political? Well, no, yeah, I mean, at all? the people who voted for Donald Trump, they know that the kind of entertainment and Hollywood establishment and so forth think he's the devil incarnate. It doesn't make any difference to them at yeah. all. Because yeah. that's a totally different bit of their brain. Yeah. Is, is you know, affecting them there. So... You know, I thought he would, he would be better off of being saying, Jeeps, I've had one for 30 years, and, you know, they're rollicking good, you know what I yeah. mean? And, uh, and associate himself with the product as much as possible, yeah. rather than trying to use it as a kind of party political broadcast for, for no party at all, you know. I, I got the I feeling there's an element point. of the local cop, the kudos you'd get if you, if you were a right-wing cop back at the station in New Jersey. I mean, the man who nicked the kind of uh, notorious left. Well, I do, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Isn't I mean, there a pretty, bit of a... It's pretty remarkable. You would have thought somebody would say, run along now. We don't want the trouble, you know. Yeah, yeah, We yeah. don't want the publicity. Um, it, it's, a very, it's a very strange story. It is. So, so Dan, so Danny Baker, within minutes, had started a little thread. I'm sure you saw it. The Born to Rum thread. Thunderbird Road, born in the IPA. <laughs> Sherry Darling, the toast of Tom Joe, Rose Lita, <laughs> oh, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> oh, you can't good. resist, can you? Absolutely not. The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. So we're recording this on Valentine's Day. Presumably your wife woke you up this morning with a huge bunch of flowers. And, oh uh, Lord, yeah, uh, yeah. And yeah. a large card with a tray with hot pastries. Heart. Heart-shaped uh, thing of roses. I know, absolutely. The house is covered in, in uh, balloons and uh, bunting. No, very tight. No, not much. <laughs> a couple of cards, a couple of amusing little tiny presents. But, no, it's funny how those things do. It changes a bit, doesn't it, over the years? <laughs> well, I was I was only thinking because it's um, it's fifty years, pretty much to the day since uh, Carol King's Tapestry came out. It is. It is. Yeah. It's of course a great, you know, record of love songs, really. And I was thinking that, you know, they released it round about Valentine's Day, nineteen seventy-one. But Valentine's Day, nineteen seventy-one, was nothing like. Now I know it's unusual this year because people can't get the. But shops normally, it's a kind but of massive not... global industry, isn't it? They start, <laughs> I noticed the ad started about two weeks ago on the telly. Marks and Spencer's there for twenty quid. You can get these heart-shaped chocolate puddings, and you can get this, and you know. You think, my God Almighty! And the world's gone mad. Pressure, gone mad. yeah. But anyway, we thought we would mark the occasion by picking because we thought everybody really, really interested to know what are our favourite love songs, and uh, so we picked three each. Have you got your three? Do you I've want got. To go do, you first? Want to go, well, I, do you want to go first? I can we can alternate well. if you like. We can I'm alternate. Gone. All right, go on. All right, you go first. Go on. Well, I give us. I, 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 I wanted an honorary mention for uh, a couple of things for Julia by John Lennon, 
amazing supercharged piece of poetry and uh, Walk On By by Dionne Warwick. Oh, and there's, right. a, there's a, a, a Rilo Kylie song, which is kind of, it's not really a love song, it's a, love, it's a song about the, the complexities of love where the girl talks about her best friend having <coughs> a baby and she thinks her husband's having an affair. And the girl singing the song's fallen for a married man. And only in the last verse, in the last line, last sentence, do you realise they're talking about the same person? A really extraordinary love song. Oh, right. But I don't know. I mean, I've got one, the one, I, one I've chosen, which is, which is the most simple, obvious, plain, upbeat, uncomplicated expression of love, I think, is If Not For You by Dylan, which I think is absolutely brilliant. It's straightforward. It's direct. It's affecting. It's charming. It's genuine. It's built around that kind of song construction, lyric construction you used to get in great Tin Pan Alley songs, like I kick, Get A Kick Out Of You. You just take one theme and you kind of follow it through. Mm. So it's, you know, if not for you, the winter would have no spring. I could hear the robins sing. The sky would fall. The rain would gather too. You know, uh, if not for you, I couldn't find the door, couldn't even see the floor. It's just those very, very simple expressions, which I think is, I, I think it makes it really memorable. It um, makes me think of the Richard Thompson song, The Dimming of the Day. I oh, need, yeah. I need you at the dimming of the day. It's the idea that you, you, you always go through low points. Yeah. Uh, and that's when you need people. <laughs> I, th I thought it was a beautiful idea. It is, that's lovely. I need you at the dimming of the day. Yeah. Go on, what you got? Well, the first one I picked, because because mine, you know, I, I just looked at them after I picked them, I realised they're a little bit of a story, actually. Yeah. Um, the first one is is thinking about kind of, I don't know, I don't know if it's over-dignifying it to call it teenage love, but obviously there's millions of songs written about teenage love. But but what that basically is, is romance, isn't it? You yeah. Know, that, it's your first experience of anything like that. And it's uh, it's profoundly destabilising and also simultaneously utterly thrilling. Yeah. Utterly thrilling. And it turns the most um, standard domestic prosaic day in, day out round of going to school or coming back or hanging around the shopping centre or going to the, you know, the, the Friday night youth club disco, as it was yeah, in my yeah. day, or what, or hanging around the bus station. It turns all those things into fantastic theatres of drama, yes? Because I've always, and this is where pop music has always come in for me, that I've always felt that pop music, great pop music, so much of it is about... It's about entering rooms. It's about going into places where you're suddenly plunged into this drama. And of course, when you're 16 or whatever, and you have some kind of thing going with a girl, or you'd like to have some kind of thing going with a girl, that's where that drama takes place. It is. It's, that, it's, it's a piece it's, of theatre, isn't it? I saw her standing there. He's like here. Yeah. He's there. Yeah, <laughs> all, absolutely. All that kind of stuff. Yeah, and so and the temperature so, in the room has changed, hasn't it? That's right, absolutely. And and you know, and it's a long time ago, but we can all kind of remember those feelings. And certain great songs are written about that kind of moment of entrance. And you know, things like Bruce Springsteen's "Thunder Road" is is a terrific example of that. But uh, and. Um, the one I love more than any, and I often think is the greatest pop song ever written, is When You Walk in the Room by Jack, oh, Jackie Oh, God, Jackie DeShannon. Oh, that's a fantastic. <laughs> you which, know, which also contains the word nonchalant, which nonchalant. doesn't happen very often, does it? It does pop music? That, yeah, but it's the idea she can hear symphonies, you know. Every oh, time that you walk in the room, you know, oh, just, I can hear the guitars playing, playing lovely tunes. Lovely tunes every time that you yeah. walk in the room. I feel and a summer's night with a magic moon. Oh, that is an incredible piece of writing. It's, it's brilliant. And she wrote it when she's very young, you know, she's probably yeah, yeah. 18, 19 or something. And uh, and also it's gay, it's 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 always played with that hook line, isn't it? That was on her original version of it you know it's been done thousands of times over the years searches had a hit with it in the 60s bruce springsteen what you mean it. the guitar riff the guitar riff which, which sounds like a fanfare yeah. you know yeah, so it it's got that idea that it's the beginning of a play you know? yeah it is and so i always think that's the most beautiful kind of expression of um 
uh, of the thrill of teenage romance still for me now. Oh, that's lovely. There's can, a I, few, can, there's I, a... can I carry on, actually, if I carry yeah, go my on. theme through? Yeah, go which, on. Which, sorry, I've cut across your... We go back to your points. <laughs> sorry. I'm just going to say there's a great like a clip man, of... That's like a minister in Parliament. Yeah, we'll, yeah. I'll take your questions later. It's, uh, <laughs> let me finish. Let me finish. That's right, yes. No, carry on. Let go me on, be go completely on. clear. No, I was going to say there's a great clip of Jackie the Shannon playing, which I think we've talked about on podcast oh, before, yeah, which yeah. on YouTube, where she comes in, it's a mime, and she comes in at the wrong time at the beginning. It's so sweet. Oh, Wonderful little dance God, what a great song. Jeez. So that, that's kind of teenage romance. And then my next song it is... I guess came to my my son got married a year ago and uh, and you know a few months before they were talking about there was I was I was there for a conversation about what music they were going to play uh, not not the wedding but the uh, the first dance and all those kind of things and I almost suggested something but thankfully I'm old enough and wise enough to realize no don't suggest anything because it will be in the nicest possible way kicked into touch. And that's fine, because that's the, you know, those kind of decisions are, are theirs and theirs alone. But only because I'd recently heard a song and, um, and I thought to myself, this is the best first dance song I've ever heard. And nobody will be dancing to it because it's not famous enough. But it's it's by Erin Bowday, who I think I was talking about the the other week on the podcast. Yeah, you so, were, yeah. So she's a singer, songwriter, pianist, and so forth. Comes from St. Louis, and uh, she's never had hits or anything, but but she's just ter- terribly good. And uh, and she and uh, and the guy in a band who played, played piano, they wrote a song called "Long Long Time," and uh, it's a kind of slow dance song. And it starts the rest of your long your life is a long, long time. It's hard to gauge when you're 25, you know. But but the refrain of the song is we're taking all the rest of our lives. And I thought, that's just a beautiful idea for a wedding dance. It really you're is. Taking all the rest of your life. Yeah. That it's 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 not in a, you're not in a hurry at all. You know what I mean? This is this is absolutely. But also, the you've long acknowledged the, 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 the exactly the long haul, the, the big race ahead. You know, that's a lovely idea. Uh, it's a brilliant. What you're, what you're entering into is that huge. Yeah, absolutely. You can't think about it, but never mind. Yeah, it's just it's one day at a time. Growing well, old together, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and that that then takes me to the third song. We say I only realised after I put these three together. It's a bit of a bit of a story. Is is uh, Randy Newman's been married twice. Uh, first marriage, when he early 20s, I think. And uh, and they had three boys, I think. And then they divorced in middle age. And he remarried a younger woman and they had two girls, I think. So it's two very different families. But on his, on his record, Bad Love, which must have come out sometime in the last 10 years, I always think the great thing about Randy Newman, there are many great things about Randy Newman, but, but the really great thing is he, 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 he kind of writes songs that are, that are, if I can put it this way, that are what the heart thinks. You know, what, and the heart doesn't think what it's supposed to think. The heart thinks what the heart thinks. You know, and very often those thoughts are suppressed. But he wrote a song, and God knows how he explained this, to his his present wife, it was a song about his first wife. Oh yes, that's and right. And he wrote a song yeah. about his first wife. You know, and yeah, yeah. Divide, we're divided by time and by distance, but the refrain of the song is, "I miss you, I miss you, I'm sorry, but I do, I miss you." <laughs> and I thought that was such a wonderful. Wonderful idea, you know. It, it is a wonderful idea. You don't get the impression listening to that song that he wants her back or that he's made no, some trouble mistake. Still. But the, the the great thing about it is it acknowledges that you can spend twenty or so, so years with somebody and it not be completely abandoned. And of course. you know, and that it's still a big part of you, and what and it should legitimately be so. You know, the best possible world. A- absolutely, yeah, yeah. You, you can't you can't write that stuff out. No, you can't. You can't. You know, it's part of you. It's part of both of you, and you know, him and his first wife, and their children, and you know, and their and their shared story, and so forth. And I just thought, 
I just thought, what a wonderful song. That so, is a fantastic song. Those are, those are my three. They're very, oh, they're they're very really, different. really good. Anyway, anyway, go on, back to you. Really good. No, I was going to mention, um, I was going to mention one by Lucinda Williams, who I, I, I like enormously. And oh, uh, she right. wrote you, one song. You went out for Valentine's Day dinner. With you Lucinda. know, we did. That's right. God, when would that have been? It was the first issue of Word, wasn't it? It must have been about 2002 or something, 2003. Right. I interviewed her. That's right. <laughs> It was fantastic. We were trying to get a, we were trying to get a, 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 a reservation in a, in a restaurant to go out and do this interview in um, Silver Lake in, in Los Angeles, where she lives, and um, and both of us being almost exactly the same age. Actually, we kind of forgotten it was Valentine's Day, you know, and. <laughs> And then we get into this restaurant and the entire place is full of just couples with little pink heart-shaped um, <laughs> menus, you know, drinking oh, pink God. drinks, little violin player, but I think man offering bouquets of roses to be bought for the lovely lady. And at first it was quite funny and then it became really embarrassing. We thought in the end we ought to just pretend that we were some couple who'd been together for a... We were being terribly romantic and going out and having a meal. But it was, oh, it was pretty funny. God, we did stand out of it. But yeah, she, she wrote a song about um, about trying to recover from the love affair uh, that's finished. And it's a wound that's very, very slowly beginning to heal. And uh, and she, can, she she thinks there'll be a day soon when she can function without this guy. And like all the characters that she gets uh, romantically entangled with, this is uh, obviously a very kind of idiosyncratic type. She talks about your pale skin, your sexy, crooked teeth, the trouble you'd get in in your clumsy uh, way. It's yeah. brilliant. And at the end, she just says, uh, and I guess one afternoon you won't cross my mind over time. And I think that was such a wonderful image that just in one day one she, she just what she won't think about this guy. <laughs> and she'll be kind of free of it all. She will have yeah, escaped, you know. Yeah. But I think my, my absolute favourite, actually, which is just a complete heartbreaker, is Heart Like a Wheel by Anna McGarrigal. Oh, oh, Remember that for oh, Kate on the Kate and Anna McGarrigal album? Oh my lord, it's the most forlorn song. And it has that kind of uh, extraordinarily dramatic tension of the organ and the harmonium and the button accordion at the beginning. And it's about lost love being irreparably broken by an unrequired, by, 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 by love being, uh, people being sort of permanently damaged, if you like, by, by, by having fallen in love with someone and it going wrong. And it's the most profoundly sad, heartbroken record ever made. I think it really puts you through the ringer. Yeah, and you go. Yeah, it's only it's lo it's only love, and it's only love that can wreck a human being and turn them inside uh, inside out. And the, yeah, the refrain is: some say the heart is just like a wheel. When you bend it, you just you can't, can't mend, mend it. it. But my love for you is like a sinking ship. My heart is on that ship out mid out in mid ocean. And it's, I think it's absolutely utterly heartbreaking. Yeah, it's not a very upbeat record, but I would say that's that. I think is probably the greatest love song ever written. Yeah. It's, a, it's an absolute classic. So going back to uh, Carol King's Tapestry, which, as I say, fifty years ago today, yeah, and um, and that that's got uh, will you will you love me tomorrow? You know, yeah. which which we we still I still think of as will you still love me tomorrow? You know, even yeah. though it's it's actually will you love me tomorrow, and um, and that still seems to me to be the the great kind of archetypal love song particularly from a from a female point of view you know what i mean that um you know it's, it's all passionate clinches and so forth and then but will you still be there tomorrow Absolutely. and it, it meant as much to the kind of teenage world as it meant in the kind of 30 something world of carol king at the Completely. time of tapestry and of course the funny thing is words written by jerry goffin a man yeah <laughs> Yeah. As was there's uh, an irony. <laughs> yeah. As is you make me feel like a natural woman, which is also on that on that record. Yeah. Both cases, lyrics written by what a husband at the time. And uh, and just kind of you know, very often the greatest songs are just the things written to order, yeah, yeah. are they? You know, they're, they're just they're just gigs, you know. Somebody needs a song for Aretha Franklin. It's got to be called Natural Woman. Now go away and do it. Yeah. And they did. <laughs> Such a romantic record. Well, Joni Mitchell and James Taylor appear in backing vocals, don't they? Well, I think I think Joni Mitchell's on that one. Blue and same time. And weren't they having a love affair at the same well, time? Well, that's the funny thing, you know. It's all it's a song about you know, tonight with words unspoken. You tell me I'm the only one, but will, will my heart be broken when the when the night meets the morning sun? And you're thinking, 
all these people singing this, they've all shagged everybody yeah, just know. just in the last week. <laughs> <laughs> busy, busy people. <laughs> <laughs> She's a genius at uh, uh, social media, I think. She posted the other day a picture of Telemachus the cat that oh, right. on the cover when uh, Telemachus was a kitten. It was just, that was such oh, a brilliant really? way of connecting it. Everyone oh, would have thought, anyone that. who bought that record would have thought, oh, that's just perfect. You see, arguably, see social media is full of cats and kittens arguably, anyway. That is the great, you know. World's most famous cat. World's most famous cat, surely. Is there, is there a more widely publicised, disseminated cat? Is not a, a, no, not a I real can't one. Think of no, one. No, I can't cartoon think of one. and fictional ones, but no, not a real one. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not nothing, is it? This is a junction in the word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. So we're back for any other business. Uh, hello, Alex. How are you doing? Uh, I'm, I'm freezing. Freezing up in Warwickshire, is it? It's freezing everywhere. Well, we're hoping it's going to get better soon. Indeed. Well, it's going to change from being, I think, minus three or minus two in London today to, I think, something like 13 tomorrow, which is literally shorts, T-shirts, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of, it's lilos. <laughs> I mean, it's, I can't believe it. There'll be barbecues. <laughs> <laughs> There's somebody advertising yesterday on, on the internet for a, uh, Looking for journalists to take part take part in a project involving wild swimming. I, I thought about recommending you, Mark, because you're well, you're well I, known I, for. I haven't done it for a while, but we were we used to go every Christmas Day, the Serpentine. Uh, broke the ice one year. There's been lots of that, hasn't there? Lots of people tweeting. It's a new thing to tweet pictures of yourself plunging into. Uh, I, I think one riding. of Danny's one of Danny Baker's producers on yeah his, yeah yeah uh, on his podcast. Is uh, w- w- there was film of her it was of her swimming into somewhere. I can't imagine Perishing how cold that was. Oh my god, <laughs> terrible! So uh, we we also should note the sadly the the passing of Johnny Rogan, uh, the author of um, well lots of books books about Ray Davis, uh, the Seven but- Alliance. The book about the, the Smiths book about and Morrison about and Miles. The Smith. Fantastic. He wrote a very book, good book about managers, about rock and roll yeah. managers way back in the day. And uh, and we had him as a guest in Word of Your Ear probably three years ago now, yeah. uh, talking about his his birds book, the massive, uh, great. Two volumes. Of about the bird. like volumes. Amazing. Absolutely. And so he's, uh, you know, he's, he's very dedicated. Incredible man. guy. He was the most dedicated guy. He talked about the fact he wrote at night, didn't he? Because he got the most. That was where he could really concentrate and really quiet. And he lived in this completely isolated world. I mean, I think almost to the exclusion of all else, writing those books. They were a lifetime's work, weren't they? Yeah. Never seen anybody so dedicated and so obsessed with with detail. Incredible, really. Yeah. They're, they're brilliant books, I think. The Johnny Rogan uh, chat from Word in Your a few years ago is available wordpodcast.co.uk on Spotify, is it? Alex, I don't know. Is it on Spotify? Everything? Yep, Apple, on YouTube, Deezer, uh, YouTube. Uh, no, yeah. no, no, I don't think it is on YouTube actually. The older ones aren't. Um, but all the all the major sort of digital yeah. service providers, you can you can find it. But you if you want to find it. it the copy and the links that went along with the original podcast will be on wordpodcast.co.uk. Okay, okay. And so what have we, we should done? also mention some of the people we've done recently. We've done some great uh, great play. One's just out, I think, Bernard Doherty, old pal of ours, the great uh, <laughs> king of PR, who is just brilliant. <laughs> He's really, absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. I mean, all those people... days of being a DJ and uh, just working with all these acts. And, oh, just full of terrific uh, stories. Absolutely. And, uh, of course, loads of people have been saying on Twitter, oh, I'd never... I'd never heard of Bernard, and of course, which is kind of a bit odd for for, for us because we think, God, hasn't everybody heard Legend. of Bernard? <laughs> Rang him every day for twenty years. I know, I know. <laughs> but why should they have done exactly? Well, they, they might, might remember him from Live Aid. He was the PR yeah. of Live Aid. Yeah. But the other one we did recently, which I thought was really good. I don't think it's up yet, but I'm sure it'll be up probably by the time this is out. Which is the mid year, mid year interview. Who is another just phenomenal talker? So funny. Everything he says is so. Interesting and colourful, and yeah. considered. He's also got a great life story. And that was Happy, that was stuff our... about touring Europe before uh, we joined the EU. So he knows whereof people speak when they say yeah. it's going to be tough out there after Brexit. He's and that was uh, that was our hundredth uh, word in your act. It was. It was our, our centenary. Yeah. Yep. Um, but we're, we're not stopping there. We keep ploughing forward. We're doing more in the next week. 
Uh, there'll be more Crowdcast action coming up soon, uh, featuring authors of fascinating new music books. Uh, we've got the quiz going from strength to strength on a Friday evening. That's the way the increasing number of people are choosing to kick off their weekend. <laughs> And uh, what else we got going forward, Alex? Anything we ought to mention? New patrons? Anything? Indeed, we, we do indeed have some new patrons. Um, Anne Kemba. I Welcome still aboard. I, still haven't got, I said I was going to get the pipe. Oh, you were going to get the pipe, pipe, weren't you? To pipe them and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't carry on. And good news. <laughs> Nicholas Foreman. Hurrah. Hello, Nicholas. Ian Gould. Oh, good yes. Thought he'd and, never join. And these are all uh, annual patrons. Of course, Ooh. on an annual subscription, you get a 15% discount. There's people treated with additional respect. Indeed. And uh, you get the birthday visit, don't you? Uh, actually, these are yeah, annual access on areas. So, yes. Yeah. You get, you, get, okay. you get Mark and Dave shilling up your digital drain pipe. Yeah, Down. excellent. Yeah, OK. <laughs> and uh, Mike Rads and Alan Wilkinson. Well, Terrific. welcome, welcome them all. And, you know, we do all this stuff. There's only one way to make sure you get all of it. You get it in vision where appropriate and you get it in full and you get it first. And that's by becoming a supporter on Patreon. And you can find out more about that. Patreon.com slash word in your ear. OK, I'm off for a spot of wild swimming. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast was brought to you by The Word. Hey.